Hello and welcome to the RPG Academy podcast. I am Michael and I'm here again today with Tom. Tom, say hello to everyone. How's it going? It's going very well. And we are here today to do our second The Review podcast. Uh, this is also being recorded for YouTube, but so there's going to be some visual elements, but we are going to do our best to make it also palatable for our audio only uh, listeners. Uh, but if you do want to see what we're talking about, you can go to the YouTube page. It'll be there as well. So Tom, what are we doing our The Review on today? We are doing the review of the Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition Essentials Kit that was released yes. earlier this spring through Target stores and then released on a wider release through game stores and Amazon this past September. Yes. Now, when 5th edition, not necessarily when it first rolled out, but early in the 5th edition cycle, there was a starter set, which I've, is still available. Uh, originally retailed for, I think, $20. Now I've seen it as low as like seven seventy five on Amazon. Yeah. Uh, very reasonable. We, we did not do a full, the review on that starter set, but I know I talked about it a couple times and genuinely, sorry, general, I can't talk. Generally, I liked it. Uh, I'm not sure there's some combat issues with that module, which is a, is a pretty hefty module, but I think for a new DM, you could very easily wipe out the players very quickly, uh, which I think is a bit of a problem. But overall, I thought it was kind of cool. Then they came out with a Stranger Things themed starter set, which is still available as well, which I think it retails for around $30. I do not have that one. I didn't buy it, so I don't know for sure. But it's supposed to be based off of the Stranger Things campaign that's featured in season one of that show, where you basically played the same campaign that Mike was running his players through. This is the newest version, the Essentials Kit, which is the new starter set. And again, for those watching, I'm going to do an unboxing video as well as a review. So I'm going to open the box, kind of go through what's in there, show it as best I can to the camera. Tom has already read through this thoroughly, so he will be providing some color commentary. He's also going to show on his video, which is much closer, the same thing, so you'll kind of see it better. Uh, but while I'm opening this up, why don't you give us your quick overview of the Essentials Kit? So first off, I'm not going to bury the lead. I absolutely love this product. So it is, um, like you were saying, the starter set, it came out, it was actually, the original starter set was actually the fir very first product released for Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. It was released for, through, for all, before any of the core books. So that product, it wasn't, there was, it still fell kind of in development. Whereas this product now, coming out five years after the original release of 5th edition, it feels really, really complete. It is a, what it, it comes with, it is basically a box that includes an adventure, some rules, some dice, and pretty much everything that you will need in order to play Dungeons and Dragons. And so we'll, we'll go through the contents of it, but that's kind of the overview. It includes rules for up through level six. It includes monsters, magic items, a GM screen. There's all sorts of stuff included in this box set. And again, it's they, $25, $20 now. It's $25 in game stores, which that is an absolute steal. But don't actually steal it. Okay. Don't steal it. So I've now opened my copy of the box. I've, I've laid on the table. I'm opening it. Um, first thing I wanted, just my first general impression is, I think the art on the cover is pretty awesome. I would say it's BA. Uh, again, for those of you who are listening, it shows a... It's a white dragon, but it looks almost emaciated. Like, at least in, to me, it looks like it's very thin and almost bony. Uh, it appears to be on, like, a top of a mountain covered partially in snow. And there is a, looks like to me, a female elf wizard casting some sort of magic missile, as well as a halfling uh, that seems to be fighting the dragon as well. I think that's pretty BA. And especially if you're D&D, &D, Dungeons and Dragons, right on the cover. They're not, they're not burying that lead either. There's a dragon right there. No, it's a very, it's some really cool art. And I will, the art in this is other, we'll dive into that. But generally the art is really good in here. The it's, I'm pretty sure they use the same artists for the, that that was, that did a lot of the um, player's handbook as well as the, the starter set. So I'm not sure what their name is, but it's, it's all very reminiscent. The one thing I will point out, the reason that it looks really 
like you said, emaciated and bony. It is actually a young white dragon. Oh, so okay. also, so some so spoiler warning here. So there's a young white dragon in this. So which is really cool too, because like the original starter set, there was a young green dragon. So they really, it really wants you to early levels of Dungeons and Dragons, you can still fight dragons. So right. And that's something cool. I've done as a DM when I want my players who are lower levels to fight dragons. I usually throw a, a sick dragon or a young dragon at them so that it's not just a, we have to run away or the dragon's going to kill us. Okay, yes. so, so I've opened my set. So the actual thing that is on top is a set of dice. These are red polyhedrals. If you are familiar with D&D or role play games in general, uh, you're probably already familiar. It looks to have all the fan favorites you would expect. You got your D4s, you got a D6, actually you got th four D6s. Four D6s. So a full set of D6s. A full set. Uh, got a D8, looks like two D10s so that you can roll percentile. So there's a, a D10 that has like one zero for one, two zero for two, and then a D10 that just has one, two, three, four. So you can roll mess percentile as well. And then you have your D12, the most underrated but much loved dice, uh, or should say die for Michael. It's the best die in the, in the game. And two D20s. Correct. It is a, which if you want to compare this to the, we, we talk about this in our episode that we did about dice. We, if you want to compare it to the, the original set, which came in the starter set, it only, the starter set only included one D6. It only included a D10. It didn't include a percentile. And it only included one D20. Does this only have one D22? Yes. No, no, okay, this has some, two. no there's two in this one. Okay, I, I, that's okay. I'm missing one. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, but um, no, they're very, they're very nice dice. Very easy to read. So somebody like myself who wears bifocals and has trouble seeing stuff, like this is, this is great. There, there's no, I can't use like marble dice or anything. That was, so like these are just plain red, kind of, um, translucent, but they have it's they're really high contrast, really easy to see the numbers. So I do love the fact that in the, the set they included four d sixes and two d twenties, but I have to say I think the color scheme of the original box set, the blue slightly marbleized, are mm -hmm. much prettier. These these they're, are pretty. Th these are functional, but they're kind of kind of plain. They are absolutely plain, but they are functional. And I do like playing again. I said the same thing I, at my age clarity of reading the die is probably mm -hmm. the biggest thing i look for definitely these do that but i also think the ones from the first set do as well i think those are also very le legible i just think they're prettier so yeah. all right fair enough moving on so the uh, the next thing in the book or the box i should say is the actual adventure itself now i want to we're going to circle back to this because i actually want to cover this last because this will probably be a larger section uh but the the cover of the module, which is called Dragon of Ice Fire Peak, which makes sense because they're fighting a white dragon on the top of a mountain. Uh, it's the same art from the cover of the box, but on the back, it actually shows four adventurers, five, looks like traveling to the mountain through like a wilderness road. Uh, we don't know what happened to the first three adventurers. Maybe they didn't quite make it to the top, but we'll get into that in a little bit. So we're going to move on to what's next in the box. Oh, we're going to see this art again, and it's... It's very good. All right. So the, so the next actual thing in the box is a card holder. So it's a little cardboard box that's flattened out. You can basically crunch the sides and then flip the top. And it's like a gray sort of swirly color. And it says D&D Essentials Kit. Tom is holding his up to the camera, so it's much easier to see. Uh, so I'm going to assume that there are some cards later in this box that are going to fit into this box. There are a whole lot of cards. Excellent. So, All right. Speaking of which, you may things. have them in your hand. Yeah, the very next thing is a sheet of paper. This is like cardstock perforated. These appear to be initiative, initiative counters. There's nine of them. They go from one to nine and you can, you know, bend them and pull them and tear them apart and they will fit into that box, box nightly, nicely. Yes. So I know what initiative is. I get the concept of these cards, but my first initial thought is, well, what happens if there's a tie? Because there's only one through nine, 
Michael, that means that you don't know fifth edition rules well enough. <laughs> you know, that's, that's not actually uh, a surprise to most, I would say. No, it's based on, if there's a tie, it's usually based on who has the higher decks. Gotcha. So, so no, but what fair I assume, question. So what, but what I assume here is that these cards don't actually relate to the numbers. They just re relate to the placement. Yes. So you exactly. might roll a 25 for initiative. I don't worry about the 25. I just give you the number one card, assuming mm -hmm. that no one has higher than 25. So you don't actually need duplicates because once you've broken the tie, you just give them the card that their fourth or fifth exactly. or fifth or sixth. Exactly. Gotcha. Exactly. Which is, these are great cards. They remind players um what order they're in it's a big number it's just a number on it gotcha so you know and we've talked in many episodes before different ways people do initiative and track it um do you think these these cards are actually a good and functional way to manage initiative at your table yes personally for me um i do so Actually, if you want to go to my Twitter, I actually, when this came out in September, I have a long tweet thread where I do my, my unboxing and get, took good pictures of every single component. And I talk about these cards because I love initiative cards, but I like tent folds. So basically what I'll have is almost like a, a, just a small card that I can fold so it stands up. These don't fold. I'm like... One more, one so more full. You all were so close. You could have done it, but no, these are really good ways to track initiative. All right. I, I, again, I think this is probably designed for people who are new to the game, either new to the hobby as a whole or new to D and D. I think they're very, very functional myself. I don't think I would use them unless I was playing this game with young kids, like my kids who are now eight and nine, I could see me using it with them. I think if I'm playing with, adults closer to my age, I, I don't know that they would be as useful to me. But again, I've never actually used them. I don't know. Maybe they're great. Uh, I don't dislike them. I love the idea of them. I just don't know if there's something I would actually use at the table a lot. All right. So next thing is another sheet of uh, like card stock perforated cards. Uh, on the front, we have some conditions restrained with some artwork it shows uh someone stuck to a wall with a spider web and a giant spider prone uh, a fighter on the ground about to be squished by a rock by an ogre poisoned magic charm unconscious stunned and then three that just say combat and then on the opposite side surprise surprise each of those conditions is accompanied by the rules of that condition and how they would affect your character in the game and the three that are combat have combat step by step. So it explains step one, determine surprise, two, establish positions, three, roll for initiative, four, take your turn, five, begin the next round. So basically, yeah. these are condition cards and combat uh, cheat sheets. These are really good condition cards because they show you the rule, but then they also show you the picture that's like, this is what it looks like when you're grappled. I love when you, I love when RPGs illustrate rules so these are really good um we are going to skip right over these combat cards because these are very bad okay. so what they are is the combat cards themselves valiant effort on the but what it does is it sh explains combat step to step but one of the beautiful things about dungeons and dragons fifth edition there isn't a whole lot of steps to combat so what would have been more useful to show what you can do within combat? Because so often I see players, they're not, they know what the next part of combat is. It's your, your roll initiative, you take your turns, you rinse, wash, repeat. And it's basically what's on the back here. But if it said stuff, if there was a list in here that was like, you can attack, you can use a object. There is all these different things that you can do cast a spell, grapple somebody, different actions, instead of just stuff that most people, even beginners, are going to get. Yeah, I, I have to say that uh, my initial blush looking at those, uh, when I think of a combat cheat sheet, I think of a combat cheat sheet that explains, again, how does grapple work? Because that's yeah. a rule that most people mess up. What does an improvised action look like? What is uh, an, an unarmed attack, a melee attack, ranged attack? Something like that would have been beneficial. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it seems to me that the, the biggest hiccup in combat that, that it is addressing 
is surprise, which a lot of people just skip over, but it is a part of initiative. And then it's the taking turns part that, that causes a lot of new players trouble because they don't know what they want to do on their turn. Exactly. So I don't, I don't find those cards helpful at all. I would, have, I would have liked a card that said establish surprise and then kind of break down that process. Because even, again, I've been running this game for a very long time. I almost always forget surprise unless it's I've included like I know that I'm going to ambush the players so I know to look to see if they're ambushed and surprised because of it but other than that I can't think of a time I've ever like like hold on wait we have to see if anyone is surprised it just doesn't come up I don't use that rule yeah which will it's there's a uh, GM screen spoiler in this and those actions are actually covered on there so but the GM typically doesn't need the actions in combat as much as the players Correct. so anyway all right, so the next one is, an, is just a continuation. It's another perforated nine-card cheat with additional conditions, including deafened, charm, blinded, incapacitated, grappled, frightened, petrified, paralyzed, and invisible. Yep. And again, on the backside, it has those rules of what those conditions are in the mechanics of the game. Yes, it includes all of them, which I am really glad. Uh, as someone who likes spell cards for d and see, those I do find useful. The condition cards, I think those are a cool thing to have around it's another thing like if your character is deafened you can hand that player the card and let them refresh themselves with the rules it just it's an it's a nice little resource that keeps you from having to flip into books um so yeah so definitely think those are cool again heavy card stock glossy um paper with a the black and white drawing on the front of what most of them look like uh the incapacitated one's kind of funny it shows uh it looks like a woman who might be drunk because there's some like like little bubbles coming off of their head, which I've seen uh, in art sort of initiate or indicate someone might be inebriated with uh, what looks like a pseudo dragon sitting on their chest. So that one's just kind of funny. Uh, and the paralyzed one is actually cool too. It has a looks like a ghoul dragging off a stunned paralyzed adventurer, probably to eat them because ghouls can par uh, petrify you and paralyze you. I should say, very very cool. All right, I'm not going to take the time to. Rip that one in perforations, we'll just move on. Yeah, because there are a lot of cards. All right, so the next thing here is another, basically the same type of paper, perf perforated sheet. And this one has, uh, I'm going to guess these are NPCs because these are art, character art. Uh, basically like um, high waist and up of mm -hmm. a bunch of different people. Yeah, so these actually, you're pretty close. They're NPCs, but they go beyond that. So this, this new um, Essentials Kit includes rules for one-to-one -one play. So one GM, one player. And when I say rules, take that very lightly because they don't add a whole lot. What they say is give your player an NPC to go with them, okay? So what these are, are th these are these NPCs. And it includes nine of them. There's a lot of different, they, they've ver a lot of variety with them and they include personalities, ideals, and then what they are. So you can look up their stat block. But that's the, one of the things, if we were ever going to touch on it, people talk about, hey, what are the one-to-one -one rules for fifth edition that are included in the essential skip? There really aren't any. It's just give your, give your player a NPC and that's what these are. So really i mean they're they're cool npcs though so i like the art i like the npc card but this is a michael thing i would never give a player an npc to as a tag along i hate that i'm never going to do that um if you just have one player then just write an adventure that works for one player i know people do it and they love it i'm not saying it's objectively wrong subjectively i do not like doing it and i'm not going to do it yeah i think really what it was doing was um they're trying to lower the barrier of entry here right if you only have one person you can still play exactly they wanted this to be super accessible to pick up totally understand i would never give a player an npc in a traditional DD game though but i think I've, I've already said i'm running this with my daughter right now and it's just myself and her and we've and i let her go through these and she picked out the npc that she thought sounded the coolest and 
um, that she thought was the most friendly. And surprise, surprise, she picked the NPC with the unicorn mask. <laughs> so, um, but you know, it just, it adds another element. So she's always got like somebody she can interact with and I can use to help draw and ask her questions, but more in game and not just Tom asking her, hey, wh what do you want to do now? I can say this NPC asks you, hey, what do you want to do now? So gotcha. that's what I use them for. I, and I could see that working better again with a younger Player? younger inexperience absolutely yeah but i just i i do not like dm controlled characters uh, i've had too many bad um experiences with them both doing them poorly and being in games with them being done poorly and i'm a big believer that you as the dm can make a game that works with less than four players yes. you just have to make an adventure that makes sense yeah uh, this one does involve a dragon so maybe that doesn't make sense maybe you need some npcs but we'll get to that um, so I kind of cheated while Tom was talking. The next four cards or four things in a row are magic items. These are again, are these sort of heavy cardstock, glossy front. Uh, there's nine per sheet and there are various magic items. Just again, very quickly, we got plus one weapons, potions of water breathing, healing potions, gauntlets, goggles, hats, so on and so forth. So Tom, talk about some magic items. All right, so this is actually one of my favorite parts of this box. So this includes, like you said, a ton of magic items. And this is a relatively short adventure. So to include this many magic items is, I think is really cool. Because one of the things that I really like about new supplements is I love magic items because they're just cool things to throw into your adventures to allow the players to feel more fantastical about what they're doing. And I will say this, these magic items are some of the best magic items I've seen in a fifth edition product because it's not all combat or adding to you get this modifier skill i pulled out some of my favorite ones sure and so there's four of them and i really just want to talk about these ones my first one is called the goggles of night what these do is they're basically lenses that give your character dark vision hey pretty much every single race in dungeons and dragons fifth edition has dark vision so you take this card right away and you give it to your human player and then <laughs> done with that the next item is just called the dragon slayer it's a sword that is all about it just sounds really cool and it's just it's a really cool just a really cool sword and then what what better dungeons and dragons magic item than a dragon slayer but my two favorite items all right the dread helm all right i was like oh this is going to be some necrotic nonsense right here but no it literally just says this fearsome steel helm makes your eyes glow red when you wear it that's it you wear your eyes glow red i mean there's no like plus one intimidation it's just like your eyes glow red it's how cool is that that is all very right. cool. it is so the best item though is the item that will allow your players to actually spec out Batman in Dungeons and Dragons. Okay, it is called a Cloak of Billowing. While wearing this cloak, you can use a bonus action to make it billow dramatically. <laughs> it's so cool. So, some really good magic items in here. Uh, obviously, I could say it. all of the cards just say magic item on the front, and then they give the what it is on the back and the rules for it would be cool to have some care some some art on each of these yeah. some black and white art but especially you know we're talking about the, the largest rpg producer you think they could have sprung for it but i understand they were trying to keep the costs down so these are still really cool all right um I, I do like the idea, again, of giving physical cards, particularly to younger or newer players, that, you know, it, there's that tactile sense of, I'm handing you a card, you have this magic item, it represents that magic item, it has the rules of how it works on the card, so they're nifty and handy, uh, you can give it away if you need to give that to another player, if you consume it, you can give it away, if it's damaged, you can give it, give it back, so there's a there's that tactile sense that I do think is helpful and kind of fun. Looking yeah, ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just saying, speaking of consumable items, one of the cool things they did, they included like six potions of healing. So like multiple players can have it. You can have multiples. It's not just one. So that's, that's something I really liked. Nice. Uh, so the next thing, and I, I, can, I can say this might be controversial. Um, it's another... Uh, sheet of cards again heavy card saw glossy front uh perforated it's 
it's a bunch of quests. So it's the, I go to the job, you know, job board and look for quests. Here's an actual card that has those quests on it's, them. Yes. I love it. You love it. Okay. Tell me why I, you love I it. I do because we'll get, the adventure is a sandbox adventure. So there are just all of these quests on here. It's not like details, but you can give them to the players to remind them what they're doing. So, so often in sandboxes, you can kind of just start to accumulate stuff that you're doing, but then having those quest cards right in front of you remind you that, and these aren't like crazy quests. This is a low level adventure. It's stuff like go talk to the farmer, go, um, there's a wild owl bear that's running through the forest, go find it. So it, it's just, it gives players a nice jumping on point. So I want to know, why do you think this would be controversial? Um, so a lot of the video games that I grew up playing that were RPGs like Baldur's Gate, Neverwinter Nights, and, and many, many other games, like even the most recent game I've been playing is the Spider-Man on PS4, which might be my favorite game of all time now. Um, most of them have a journal-like function that helps you figure out, oh, okay, I talked to this one NPC. I said I was going to do this quest, but then we got attacked by goblins. And, and now we're trying to track the goblins down because we think they kidnapped somebody. And then, you know, in, in the game, it might've only been three hours, but in real life, this could be two months apart. And then you're like, wait, who did we talk to? And what were we supposed to do? Mm. And so I think having those cards or having the journal in the video game is very helpful. I think those games are better for it. But one of the things about fourth edition that a lot of people did not like is how video gamey it felt. And I think giving your, your players a card that is a quest card could feel like a video gamey mechanism. And I know that sounds weird because I just talked about how there's a tactile sense of handing you a magic item. To me, this feels different. If I say, here's your quest, to me, that makes it, it's like a meta thing. It, mm. just, it feels different. And it makes yeah. it feel like we're playing a video game rather than a role-playing game. Yeah, Not saying no, I, I won't use them, but I, could, I can see other people really getting hung up on that. Where me, it's just like, eh, okay. Yeah, I think where, um, where I come down on this is I love sandbox adventures. And sandbox adventures can get really overwhelming sometimes. So I think that having these at least helps um, keep this adventure, especially for newer players, it, it helps keep them contained and that they won't necessarily feel overwhelmed i these quests are definitely very small so um it definitely does feel like something that would be like you said on a kind of a the, the old the old job board outside the tavern so what i will say though is i'm glad they're in the box even if you don't use them it, it doesn't one then just don't use them it doesn't affect you at all exactly if you want to use them you have them Mm -hmm. And kind of the hybrid, maybe as the DM, you don't hand them out, but you keep them for your own reference. Yeah, you have a tracking here. Here's all the different things that they could be doing. Or, or that they are doing and that you oh, can remember. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh yeah, they are supposed to go talk to that person. You have it in your notes. You know that they already have, you know, they started down this quest, whether you write on them, mark on them or, or not, you know, it's up to you. But I could see them being a good DM resource, even if you don't want to physically hand a card to the players. So, so if you want to use them, they're there. If you don't want to use them, you can ignore them. And if you kind of want to use them maybe differently, if they're in there, you can do that or not. So I'm glad they're in there. I just don't know that I would actually hand a card that says, here's your quest to the players. Uh, again, younger players, maybe I would. And there are two sheets of those, it looks like, or no, it's just one. I was, uh, I was taking apart my magic items and got confused. So there's nine different quest cards uh, included in the box set. And that is not, I will point this out, that is not all the quests that are actually in the adventure. Oh, so that's weird. Do you have any idea why some are and some are not? So, and I think that because these quests, these are not main quests. So these are quests that are more like side missions. Gotcha. Okay, that makes sense then. All right, so the next thing we have in our box set is a map. Uh, it is double-sided on the on one side. I don't know if it's front or not. Is uh, anyone familiar with the Forgotten Realms has probably seen this map or yes. something similar a million times. Yep. Uh, but it is a hex map. I think that, that makes me feel like the old box sets when you had like the uh, Dryal of Dread. But it's a hex map of the Sword Coast uh, from... It looks like the Mirror of Dead Men all the way up to 
past Neverwinter Wood. So it's actually a pretty small subsection of the Sword Coast. Yeah, it is the, the, I actually, what I'm more excited about is the other side. So we have, it looks to be, uh, is this Fandolin? It is Fandolin. It is the original from the starter set was, took place, takes place in Fandolin. This adventure also takes place in Fandolin. So it takes place five, four to five years after the original Wave Echo Cave that was included within the starter set. So things in Fandolin have changed. It's kind of built up a little bit more. And so this was not something that was included in the original starter set. The starter set did not include a map of the Sword Coast. This one does. And it also includes, I love this map of Fandolin to just throw it down on the table whenever the players are there in Fandolin so they can kind of see what the town looks like. And it's not like anything, there's nothing secret on here, but it's just mm. all the public buildings. Like this is where the tavern is. This is the hotel. This is where you can go to talk to the government. And that's what I was going to say is that it has. I want to read this quickly. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's only seven buildings in the town that are actually labeled on the map. Yes. You also have a miner, a miners like uh, people who mine trail, and then you have a uh, tribor trail leading off to different places within the Sword Coast. But the town itself has. I'm gonna look at map. I'm gonna guess it has like 30 buildings on this map, mm -hmm. seven of which are labeled. So yep. it's not an overwhelming amount of information. It's definitely pliable enough that you can plop in a, a different, if you want your, your town to have X, Y, or Z, like a blacksmith shop or a general store or whatever, it can have one. If you want it to have a menagerie, if you want it to have a carnival, there's plenty of empty spaces and places for that to go. Um, so yeah, I, I don't use maps and minis a lot. This is the type I would probably use. It's just a reference. Here, yes. you're in a town. This is kind of what it looks like, but we're not necessarily going to count grid squares as we're walking around town. Yeah, I'm in the same boat as you. I'm not a big, I'm not a minis uh, and map user, but I am an overland map user. And I love having large maps so players can have a visualization of where they are. And those seven buildings, like those are the public ones. Those are the ones the players know. There's all sorts of buildings that are included in the adventure that are actually still in Fandolin if you just don't tell the players that they're there until gotcha. they discover them. Excellent. All right, so the next thing, this is pretty hefty. This looks to be the heftiest part of the, the box set. It's the rule book. It's the rule book. So again, this is, uh, so flip into the back. It is a 64 page uh, glossy paper rule book on the front. It's that sort of gray swirl, but the, the off color is like clearly a dragon breathing fire. And mm -hmm. this is the rules of how to play D&D 5th edition, at least pared down enough for the starter kit. Yes, so this is actually the exact same rule book that was included in the starter set with some minor changes. Most of the text is literally the same, but one of the cool things about this as far as differences I want to point out, this has an actual binding on it. So you'll see it's bound, um, whereas the original starter set um, rule book was just stapled together. Mm -hmm. So this is a lot higher quality. The paper is a lot thicker. And, but there's not really, it's the exact same stuff. So it gives you just enough to take you up to level six. It includes the races of its elf, human, dwarf, and um, halfling. And then the classes that it includes are those classic Dungeons and Dragons archetypes, which are bard, cleric, fighter, rogue, and wizard. Because they're just giving you enough to get started because the goal here is to get you to go by the player's handbook and the Dungeons Master Guide when you're done. And that's exactly what we did after we played. We didn't buy anything until we finished the starter set. And it gave us, it gave you everything you needed to have a very hefty Dungeons and Dragons experience. So now, um, you may or may not know this. I, I don't, I'm not asking you a leading question. Is the art in here the same art from the other book or is it different? It is different. So okay. this is what is also really cool. Um, fifth edition is notorious for recycling mm -hmm. art. There is not much, there is no recycled art, I believe, in the, well, there's one or two in here and very minimal in the adventure. And actually the art is one of the things I wanted to talk about because Michael, for example, flip over to page 19. So what page 19 is, it is the, it's the rogue. 
So, but what this book includes for every single class is it includes a picture of the rogue and it's just, or a picture of that class. And it's just, it's, it's a black and white image. And what it's really trying to do is it is trying to show you, this is what we think a rogue looks like within Dungeons and Dragons in the Forgotten Realms. So it's very simple art and it does what it's meant, it does what it's meant to do. Yeah, I, the reason I asked you about the art is because I do like it. it and, yes. Um, and again, there's a lot of black and white sketches, which, again, as an art director, they're cheaper than full co full color. Uh, but I think for what these are trying to do, that that black and white works perfectly. And uh, like you said, there's one for the wizard. There's one for that. Uh, for well, this one looks like a halfling rogue. Uh, we've already but, got a rogue in there. Uh, there's a fighter one. If you flip over to the actual rules, they include art for different rules too, such as cover. So it includes, for example, a couple of gnomes behind crates and barrels, and it's displaying, hey, this is what half cover looks like. This is what three quarter cover looks like. And they do that for several other rules too. So it's not just like, it's, it's not this whole, um, what, it, what, it, what is three quarters cover? Mm -hmm. um, that's on page 37, if you look at that. And that's only one example of, of times when they do go ahead and show um, rules through art. Yeah, and you, you touched on that. I just want to throw out, I, I've said this before, but if anyone has ever read the Atomic Robo rulebook, which is a, a game that uses mostly fake core, it is by far probably my favorite RPG book that uses art to explain the rules. But what I love about it, because it's based on a comic series, they didn't create art. They found art in the in their comic that made sense for the rule. So they worked backwards, and it's it's brilliant. Plus, it's just fun to read. So uh, shout out to Atomic Robo, the RPG. Uh, so yeah, so I I think this is cool. Again, it, like I said, it's a, it's bound a little bit more durable. I do love the art. I like how some of the rules are uh, you know shown through the art, which I think is very handy to help understand what what quarter cover and half cover is. You can see, if, if I can see your your belly button, you're probably under half cover. If I can just see above your chin, you're probably three quarters cover. If I can only see your eyeball, you're probably full cover. Uh, so yeah, I think yeah. that's cool. Yeah, for anyone who's played fifth edition though, you are getting absolutely nothing new out of this. So okay. just making sure that everybody does. Okay, so the next thing we see here is a DM screen. Uh, yes. This is a four panel screen. It is landscape style. And even then it looks to be a little shorter than yes. what I would think other DM screens. So I don't know. I don't have measuring tape. I don't know the dimensions, but I'm gonna, this isn't like a, I don't know. It might be a half sheet of paper. So it might be eight and a half. No, it is. So this is interesting. This is actually, it is eight and a half. All right. Wide. So the reason that it's this obviously to continue to keep costs low. Um, just this is something that can be printed extremely cheaply. Gotcha. Yeah, this isn't really cardboard. It, it's sort of a card stock. It's card stock. And on the front side, it's uh, full color glossy. On the interior, it's basically black and white. And it's a lot of repetition of things we've already talked about. There's a page on conditions, which has the same information as the cards we've already covered. Uh, so this one does have the actions in combat you were talking about, yep. where you can attack, you can hide, you can ready, you can dash. Uh, and then it has some charts for how much things cost in an, in an inn, travel distance, cover, and it also includes some art to show the sizes uh, represented mm -hmm. next to each other. So you have tiny, small, medium, which is to be a human, large looks to be an ogre, huge looks to be like a giant, and gargantuan looks to be like a purple worm. So uh, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very, very, the information that is included is really, really good. It's got, everything that you need to run a sandbox game and it's very concise and this is the the very first dungeon master screen that was released for fifth edition we all know it was not the greatest a lot of information that we it isn't just not necessarily useful for the dm they redid it with the dungeon master screen incarnate and that was a lot better this is actually probably my favorite dungeon master screen because i actually like that it's a lot shorter so if i'm using it i don't have to like peek over it or anything if I'm sitting in a low chair it's small the art is also this is kind of what I was, this is the this is the cover art but this is the full art so you'll see that on one screen on one side it's got oh no it's different art it's slightly different but it's still showing the same thing this is very good though 
And also, there's a cat. Did you see the cat, Michael? I did. Someone else pointed it out to me. I did not see it myself. But yes, there's a cat carrying a small rat. And it's the best. Yeah. So, so I, in, this is just sort of an in general thing, going back to that first DM screen from 5th edition. I feel like that was so, sort of like an afterthought. It was. You know, it's just like, well, we need charts. And I just, I don't think there was like, how can we make this better? How can this be truly useful? Because really, and, and I did a review of that DM screen. And I gave it an okay score because it did include some things that I thought were useful. Like you could do like random NPC characteristic generation. Like, you know, you'd roll and it's like hungry or sleepy, that kind of stuff. Um, but I don't know. I, like there's, I've, I've seen a lot of conversation on Twitter. Again, I know that's a very small segment of the population anyways that don't play with DM screens at all. Like they don't like that barrier between them and their players. It, it, it feels like it stifles the flow mm -hmm. of communication. Uh, but I use one. Uh, I don't always care about what's on the inside, but I like to have one to keep my stuff separate. And I do like the fact that it's got cool art is evocative. It can help keep the players in the mindset of, Hey, we're not in Michael's basement. We're these adventurers walking through the forest with a cool ass cat carrying a rat. Yes, absolutely. Alrighty, and so the next thing here looks like a uh, bunch of blank character sheets. Yes, which is cool that they included the the original starter set included some pre gens, which pre gens are great, Love but pre they're they're pre gens. You're wanting to get a really good D and D experience, so this includes blank character sheets. So I love it. Yeah, and again, the starter set, the, the pre-gens were filled out. I do, I, I wish there were pre-gens, honestly. I would say right now I wish there were pre-gens in this game as well. But I'd also, I do, I would want both. I would like pre-gens so that I can just start playing. But I also would like to have blank character sheets if yeah, we want to add to. It's, or... Yeah, it's six character sheets, so. All right, and then the last thing actually in the book before we go circle back to the adventure is a flyer for D&D &D Beyond and when you buy the starter set, you get codes to let you get the starter essential starter kit for free in the D&D Beyond system. And there's a coupon for 50% off the player's handbook. So if you are interested in checking out D&D Beyond and some of the digital tools that are available on it, you can get what is in the essentials kit for free when you buy it, which a lot of publishers do for everything. Uh, you know, you get the, you buy the print book, you get the digital copy, D and D Beyond does not do that because they're two separate companies. D and D Beyond is like licensed by D and D, uh, but I know a lot of people who love the D and D Beyond system, swear by it, makes the game easier to run, more fun to play. Uh, so yeah, so if you're interested, buy the Essentials Kit and then get that for free, or uh, or not, it's up to you. I'm pretty sure I totally just flashed the codes for mine <laughs> on the screen, so. I will never use D and D Beyond just because I I'm not really a digital person. So if you go pause that video and snag those codes, more power to you. First first one uh, gets them. Yeah. All right. It, All right. So we're gonna talk about the adventure itself. Uh, so again, so flipping through, it's a 65 page bound book. Um, I have glanced through this, but you have read it because you're running this. Uh, so high level, what do you think of this adventure? This is a good adventure for what it's trying to do, which is be a sandbox adventure and introduce people to different elements of Dungeons and Dragons and fantasy role playing. So, what it is, where it's set, is it's set, like we've said, in the Sword Coast, in the Forgotten Realms, and it is set in primarily in the town of Phandalin and in the Neverwinter Woods territory. It is set approximately four to five years after the starter set. So it's kind of cool that they did real time with the release of the starter set and then the release of the essentials kit. So to kind of give you a five years or so have passed in the Forgotten Realms since the original um, Tyranny of Dragons. And so that's where this picks up. Phandalin is a bustling town, and you are adventurers coming to this wild frontier in order to make a fortune and then adventure. So that's kind of the, the main premise of your characters. That's how you hook your characters. So, but the overall adventure for it, there's three major plot points, and then the, the, there's there's actually one major plot point and there's two kind of ancillary ones. The major one 
is the dragon, the large white dragon that is the dragon of the title dra of Dragon of Ice Pyre Peak. So Cryovane, what a cool ice dragon name. So the, the town, this dragon's basically been terrorizing the surrounding areas. Uh, along with that, because of this dragon running around terrorizing everything, other monsters are coming out of their caves and they're being displaced by this dragon as it destroys their and takes their stuff. The other major adventure is one of the, the collateral damage of this dragon is a fortress that was where some orcs were. And so their fortress has been destroyed and now they're kind of on the, the warpath because some half-orc sorcerers and priests have come along to kind of help them out and help them get vengeance on the dragon. And then also the, um, the surrounding um, monsters. So they're kind of, these, this, these, these orc tribes are kind of out there causing all sorts of chaos. So <laughs> what it is, is it's a sandbox zone. So you start in Phandalin and there's all these different things to do. And depending on what you do, you can run into one of these three major plot points. So what the story, it, the, the very first portion is some stuff about Phandalin. And then after that, really cool. I love this. Check this out. So what it includes is it's a bunch of different like mini adventures. And each of these mini adventures covers roughly two pages. So then when you flip the next page, it's another adventure. So it's very, um, everything feels very contained. It's really easy book to use. Also, the this may annoy some people. Um, for myself who really likes organization, I actually really liked it. These adventures are not laid out in the book based on level. They're laid out in the book in alphabetical order. So it's really easy to kind of flip through to find where you need to be. Each little adventure includes a map too. So if you are into the, the, the smaller grid maps, there's some in here for some really cool dungeon crawls. And then basically what this adventure does is it takes your characters up through levels from one to six as they do these different things within Phandalin until eventually they can confront this dragon. Uh, kind of the, the plot, the, the thread throughout all of this is whenever the players go to a new location, you can roll a d20 to determine if the white dragon shows up to try to fight them. So they're level one and they can uh, potentially run into the dragon. <laughs> but here's the interesting thing. It's, it's, I, I'm okay with it. Um, if the, the, the way it's kind of worded here, some people may think this is railroady, but I think this is the good type of railroady because what you're doing is you're allowing your players to experience the dragon, allowing them to get more angry and frustrated with the dragon. If they ever take 10 hit points off the dragon, it just flees, right? Because mm -hmm. this dragon, it says in here, there's purpose. It's not trying to get into a fight or risk anything. It's a giant bully. It's going around just destroying what it can. So it doesn't need to take you out. It's just going to go somewhere else where you're not there right. and destroy that. Looking for easy targets. If the players turn out not to be easy targets, go away. Yeah. So in total, there's 20 different locations in this. So like I said, there's nine quest cards, but there's roughly, it's not quite 20. I would say there's about 15 different little quests to do. So there's some really, really cool locations in here too. There's a hunting lodge. There's a, there's a, um, a giant lighthouse that they can go and fight a storm sorcerer. Some really cool stuff. And they're all really short and contained. So you never feel bogged down in one. So almost like each session, you could potentially do one or two of these. So, and that's really the, that's the premise of the adventure. There's not too much to it to explain because like I said, it's sandbox. It's a good sandbox. It gives you all sorts of stuff to do within the town of Phandalin and then the surrounding region. The main quest is to kill a dragon, but there's not some grand plot behind why the dragon is there. It's just a dragon and it is there terrorizing people. And then yeah. eventually once you're strong enough, you'll go fight the dragon who's been annoying you the last few weeks. And I, I think that's a, just the concept of that, I think is interesting and smart. I, as someone who has ran adventures for a very long time and certainly started out as a young DM with the, there's a dragon terrorizing a town, you have to go stop it, but we're first level, that makes no sense, we're going to die. The dragon is just sort of there. They don't, they don't have to fight it if they don't want to, unless it happens to show up where they're at. Like it's causing other problems. You know, it's almost like an um, environmental effect. Absolutely. You don't have to fight the rainstorm, but the rainstorm is why 
the orcs had to leave their valley and now you have to deal with the orcs in the mountains. Uh, the rainstorm is why, you know, the, the food got washed away or whatever, it ruined the field, so people were hungry, and that's why the Thieves' Guild is so active. I, I like the fact that the dragon is just sort of the, um, the impetus and the, the reason behind the other little things or a lot of the other little things that you'll deal with, and you might eventually get annoyed, you're like, well, like, crap, this dragon's causing problems, we need to deal with it, but it's not like your quest to start with is, young adventurers, go kill a dragon. And I think that's smart design. Yeah, it's really cool. And the thing about it is this, like I said, the dragon will just show up and it's, it's so it, it makes it really feel like the world is lived in because you're running into these NPCs, not just in one location, but in other locations in this region. And it really has that. That's why I really like Curse of Strahd is because it's like this in the sense that there's all these cool different locations that your players can go explore. There's a lot of variety to them. Like I said, a lighthouse. There's this weird gnome village that has like mushrooms and wild magic effects everywhere. There's the obviously the the ice spire fortress where the dragon is. It's this like ice castle. It's really cool. There's lots of locations that there's not monsters too. It's not just they're all monster locations. There's like a hunting lodge where a band of rangers live. You can go ask for their help or get information about the forest. Uh, so there's a lot of cool stuff and a lot of stuff I like here. All right. So let's, uh, let's give our, our ratings. So if I remember our rubric that we came up with, uh, one of the first thing is like layout and design. Yes. And there's art, then there's fluff, there's crunch, and then there's overall. Is that, is that all? Yes. Of them? yes. So right. mm -hmm. let's, start, let's start with art, actually. So what rating would you give the art in the Essentials Kit? Okay. So the art. So I'm going to go ahead and give it a B+. Plus. All right. Okay. So B plus is it's that's good. There's a lot of great art in here. I love the black and white art, but the thing that kind of drags us down from an A is the interior grid maps. They're not the greatest. All right. They they look almost they look very digitally rendered. Um, almost um, it's it's they're just there's not a lot of texture to them. They're very one note. So I understand, like I said, there's 20 locations. Each of these locations has one or sometimes even two of these grid maps. So there's a lot of maps in here, but they're just, I don't think they're necessarily up to the standard that a lot of the really good maps of fifth edition have been. All right. Uh, so interestingly enough, I actually was going to give it an A minus. Uh, I don't really care about the grid maps because I don't use them. So that didn't really, you know, affect my, my, my thought process. Um, I really like the art. The reason it's an A minus and not an A or an A plus is more for what's not there. I like what they're doing with art, but I think they should have went into that. You know, like you said, there should have been art for the magic items. I would have liked to have seen art for, uh, you know, all the conditions. They don't all have them. I would like to have seen art maybe for some of the quests. Uh, in the book, I, I really like the rules being explained in art. I would have liked to have seen more of that. So it's an A minus. So I think it's really, really good. But had they done more, it would have been better. Yep. All right. So layout and design. How functional do you think this is to actually use it at the table? Uh, this one is getting an A from me because it is very, it's very usable. Um, there's lots of great charts in here, lots of indexes to tell you where to go. There is, I mean, come on, on the very back, there's a map key. To, uh, there's lots of great stuff. The adventures are all laid out in alphabetical order. Each adventure only covers a page, like so a, a one single page. So you're not flipping during an adventure. You open it up and there's everything you need to run this section of this campaign. So it's very, very useful. The cards themselves are laid out really nicely. The Dungeon Master screen is laid out really nicely. So A for me. Um, I would give it an A as well, basically, for all the things that you said. Just to clarify, in case anyone's confused, when you talk about the adventure being on one page, you actually mean two pages side by side. So when you open up the book, yes. the left and right page are the adventure. Yeah, Turn so I mean, page. yeah, exactly. So like, for example, I'm holding up right here. This is a, a you, you open up the book, you lay it on its spine, and there's a full adventure right there. Adventure. So yeah. uh, I like the cards. I like the layout. I like, I just like how it's presented. And I'm going to say, because they give you a free copy of D and D beyond of this book. I think that's, I mean, I know the, the goal is to get you to buy stuff. Like they're just trying to get you to spend money, but they're giving you a free copy digitally. So you can go and play around with that system. It gives you the access to it. 
um, it's an A. It's it's just about as good as it could get. Very very happy with the uh, with the layout and design. Mm-hmm. All right, Crunch. You want to go first for this one? What do you um, think? I, it it's the rules. It's it's not anything new. It's just a you know replication mostly of the rules that already exist that you can get for free online or if you've already bought the DMG or you already bought one of the other uh, kits. So I'm going to give it a B. It is what it is. It is supposed to be. Uh, maybe maybe slightly B plus because there are some elements of art explaining the rules, which I like, but there's not as many as I would like. Um, but it's functional. It does what it's supposed to do. It's, it's not bad, but they didn't really do anything more with it either. So solid B for me. Okay. So it's going to get a, it's going to get a C from me. Um, and I even thought about giving it a D right? Harsh. So he, he, because here's the Harsh. thing. It doesn't include anything new like you and the rules for fifth edition. I mean, they're, 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 they're good for what they do, but the thing that drags it down really far for me, and this is just me being super salty, is that one of the things that they talked about so much was like, we're gonna include rules for one-to-one play. And I'm like, cool, new rules. And then they're just like, yeah, give your player an NPC. There you go, that's <laughs> one-to-one play. I'm like, that's, you didn't do anything. Like all they were trying to do with this, which I, they were trying to get people who, didn't really need this. They know what D and D is. They're trying to get them to buy it because it's a. They're like, get these new rules. And it's not. It is give them an NPC card and there you go. So there is absolutely no new rules in this. Okay. All right. Fair. Fair enough. Yes. All right. And then fluff. What do we think of the story? Now I've I have. I mean I've I've been somewhat cheeky. I've actually opened one of these before, so I've kind of flipped <laughs> through it. Um, yep. But you've read it more in depth than I have. What do you think of the story behind the adventure? I really like it. Um, I think it's great that they continued off of Fandel, the Lost Minds of Fandelver, because that was a very good adventure. It's very nostalgic for me because I, it was my first um, Dungeons & Dragons campaign and product I ever bought and ran. And they take a lot of those elements and they build upon it. And it's interesting for the, there's lots of cool stuff in here. Um, A lot of problems that I've had with some of the recent fifth edition releases have been that they all kind of felt very samesy in one note. And this does feel, it's a fantasy adventure. So you're like, what is new or different about that? But they really understand what a fantasy adventure should be. And everything feels unique when you're going through it and none of the different locations feel the same. So there's lots of variety here. And then, Come on, fluff. Some of the, the magic items that they include. The billowing cloak gets as much, f- the highest fluff rating ever. So this is getting an A plus, all right, for I want to spend my bonus action to flutter my cape dramatically. Yeah, I know. How cool is that? That is the <laughs> definition of good fluff. Nice. Um, so I'm going to give it a B plus for the fluff. I, I'm not a person who runs a lot of ma- modules, mm-hmm. um, so I'm somewhat weighted against it to start with. But but what I have read, I really liked. I think it's a great starter adventure, which is exactly what it's supposed to be. It's sandboxy enough that if your players are having a good time and they want to go explore, they can. And they're going to run into interesting people and get a chance to do interesting things. If they are more focused on the quote unquote adventure, they can go there as directly and as quickly as they want, though. That might kill them because they're not going to be high enough level. Uh, but again, that's that's their fault. But I think it's a good starter story. I don't think it's a great story. I think it's a good starter story. Yeah, for sure. I think that um, it's interesting because it does something different than the starter set did. The starter set had a very clear through line. There were some different plots and NPCs who were doing stuff within Fandolin, and it felt more like a module. This feels like a sandbox. It's definitely, it's a different type of story. I would almost, it would be kind of cool to run the starter set as like, that's the adventure. And then you take the dragon of Ice Spire Peak and lay it on top. And it would just be, so you're doing the starter set, Lost Minds of Fandelver, but then all this stuff within Dragon of Ice Spire Peak is happening in the region. So it's, it's, it's I enjoy it. All right, very cool. So that comes down to the, our, our final rating. Uh, so this is everything accumulated together, as well as any other esoteric abstract uh, elements you want. What is your overall rating for the D Essentials Kit? 
Okay, so I'm very apt to give anything an A plus, but I'm going to actually Wait, very apt. That means you're more you're very likely to do it. Okay, I am not more likely to do that. <laughs> okay. This is like, if you go watch our if you go watch our Salmar stream, everybody knows that Tom just kind of makes up definitions for you know <laughs> everything. So anyway, you know just word garbage. So I am going to give this an A plus because mm. yeah. All right, hot, here's the thing hot. because. I know because my definition of something that is an A plus is something that I want to run, something that I'm going to take parts of, and then also you can't beat the the just the the overall value of this. It's got a great adventure. It's got a ton of the dice. It's got a fold out map. It's got a dungeon master screen. It's got all of these magic item cards, initiative cards, condition cards, and it's only twenty five dollars. Like, if our, the goal of these reviews is to tell people what they should and shouldn't buy, I would say definitely go buy this. Okay. All right. Uh, th th this is only our second, the review, but that is our first A-plus overall rating. That's, that's significant, I think. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to follow it up with a slightly lower A rating. There this you is go. not A-plus for me because it could have been better, but it's really good. Mm -hmm. As a D&D &D starter set, it's got everything that you need. And I love the fact that they include D&D Beyond. Now, I'll be honest, I have never used D&D Beyond. I don't know much about it. I'm going to take the coupon and go play around with it. That's something I'm getting ready to go do in a little bit. Uh, so you can't have my codes. Uh, but I love the fact that they include it. I love that the price point, $25. If you have someone who's thinking about getting into the hobby, that is a great price point. It's a great product for that. And I... I mean, I, I have the original starter set, and I think hands down, this is a superior product. Uh, so yeah, so it's an, it's an A for me. I think, again, we, we're doing this like a year late because it's already been out so long. But if anyone is listening to this, I think this is a great product. If, well, I guess what this might be helpful for is if maybe you're getting a gift for uh, a cousin, a niece, a nephew, someone in your family who is thinking about getting started, if you're other than running the game for them, which you still could do, I think this is a great product to buy and give someone as a gift to get them into the hobby uh, forever. Yeah. Also, the one of the things that I really like about this is even if you've played a lot of fifth edition, if you don't want to run something that's just really crazy, you just want to run Dungeons and Dragons, low prep, you're getting burnt out. This is a great adventure to do it. All the prep is done for you, and it's not it's not railroady at all. It's very it's a good sandbox adventure to play. So really, I really like it. Fantastic. Well, Tom, thank you as always for joining me for this the review. And we have more of these in the pipeline. Things are coming, but if you have a product you would like us to the review, let us know. Uh, but Tom, in the meantime, where can people get a hold of you? Can see you, find you on the internet, interact with you. What's going on? So right now, um, where I'm most active is on Twitter at BezCartom. You can go check out um, my my thread about this as well. I've got a lot of thoughts, obviously a lot of positive stuff. Uh, I've got at that time, I had a lot of hot takes about some certain things. And uh, just go, go check that out. But yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at BezCartom. Fantastic. If you would like to write into our show to give us feedback, uh, please, it's... Uh, the RPG Academy at gmail.com. Uh, ratings and reviews are always welcome. You can find us on YouTube, on Twitter, on Twitch, on Instagram, though I never post there because I'm dumb. Uh, but pretty much anywhere you search the RPG Academy, if you find something, it's probably me. I am most active on Twitter. And uh, it is Friday before a catacon. So very likely the video portion of this will not be up until after, but I think the audio portion might hit beforehand. So you can see me in a week in Dayton, Ohio, playing some games for three straight days. It's going to be a blast. It's going to be a blast. Awesome. Tom, well, thank you so much. And for everyone else, we'll give the awkward wave out and say bye-bye. All right. See ya. Oh, whoa. wait. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Michael, have you hit stop yet? No. All right. Because we almost completely forgot. Do not forget our motto. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay remember if, if you're, you're having the motto you're doing no you're, if you're if having, having fun, fun if you have fun you're doing it right that is correct and with that awful rendition of our great motto we will end the meeting bye-bye oh that was that was that was perfect <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>